good morning, everyone. Um, let me make an announcement first that the talk of Alexis Wasser on Friday, which was announced at 2 o'clock, will be at 1.30. So it's going to be a talk between 1.30 and 2.30, so you have more time to get to Venice or something. Right? So I'm, I'm, we have now the next talk today, the first talk today, that's, uh, again, Laurent de Villette, and he will continue with his third lecture now on collisions in plasmas, the lambda equation, please. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, let me recall a few things that we saw yesterday. First, if you remember, we made a sort of uh, general discussion of the contributions of various uh, colleagues to the uh, uh, entropy method, and then we turn to the definition of the Boltzmann equation, and after a certain number of computations and after having used a large number of assumptions, we ended up with the uh, abstract form of the Boltzmann equation, which is uh, written here on the blackboard. So, uh, before uh, writing a parametrization of the, of the operator, and uh, it's something that anyway we saw uh, with Daniela yesterday. Uh, I wanted to uh, discuss a little the remark, which is that there is an obvious uh, uh, class of steady states for this operator, which are the so-called uh, Maxwellians. So um, what I will call a Maxwellian systematically um, in this series of talks is a function which is the exponential of this second order polynomial in the variable v, but as v is a vector, this is not just any kind of second polynomials which would give you a general Gaussian. It is a second order polynomial in which the matrix acting on the uh, uh, second degree uh, part of the polynomial is a matrix which is the uh, a constant times the identity. So in that case, we really speak of Maxwellians, and this class of functions can be seen as a subclass of the Gaussian functions. It's exactly the subclass of the, of the Gaussian function, uh, which have a covariant matrix, which is a constant times the identity. So it's a way you should, you should see this. So let me explain why these uh, specific functions uh, play uh, an, a very important role in the theory. The point is now, suppose that you have this M of V defined like this, and let's try to see uh, what is the result of computing F of V prime, F of V prime star, and F of V, F of V star. So this is the, the remark here. So if I take for F the quantity M, and I compute M of V times M of V star, you see that I have to, to compute the following quantity. And using the property of the exponential, I can write it like exponential of 2a plus b scalar product with v plus v star minus c v square plus v star square, just like this. Okay. And under this form, thanks to the direct masses which are written here, we know that for the V, V star, V prime, V prime star, which are written here, um, V plus V star is equal to V prime plus V prime star inside the integral. And also, uh, the kinetic energy before collision is equal to the kinetic energy after collisions. So I can write this also like this. So this is true, of course, only uh, if you look at this integral.
and this is exactly m of v prime times m of v prime star. And as you can see, you get that this quantity here is equal to zero when f is m, okay? So you get this class of uh, steady states for the equation df over dt is equal, to, is equal to this quantity here, okay? So that's a very important remark for the, for the rest of the, of the lectures. Uh, let me now uh, present the uh, two typical parametrization for the Boltzmann equations. So this is another remark, if you wish. So it is possible to recast Uh, the formula which is here, which is quite abstract because of the direct masses inside uh, the integrals. So let's say the term which I called Q bolt B. So the B here is referring to the cross section B here. Okay, so I parameterize the operator by uh, this parameter here which is something which is sort of a free parameter in the, in the operator, okay. Sorry, anyway. I can recast this uh, a term as Q bolt B of F F of V equal to the integral, so now, I have an integral over 3n, in dimension 3n, and I remove a set which is of dimension n plus one. So I will have an integral over a set of dimension 2n minus one. The one will be over rn, and the other one will be over the sphere sn minus one. So this gives you something which is of size 2n minus one. You still keep the same notations for the, uh, the part which represents the gain and the loss term, and you remove the Dirac masses, and you just write B here, and now B, as we will see, So let's call it B1, if you wish. It will be a function still of the modulus of the relative velocity, but the second term will now, the second variable will in fact be the uh, uh, absolute value of the scalar product between the uh, direction of the relative velocity and this parameter omega which now lives in this sphere Sn minus one. And if you remember the formulas presented by Daniela yesterday, this is exactly identical once I write the definition of V prime and V prime star in terms of omega, and this can be done in this way. So this is usually the formula which is written down in textbooks on the Boltzmann equation. And one can check that these formulas are really exactly equivalent to saying that V plus V star is equal to V prime plus V prime star and the same for the uh, kinetic energy. So more precisely, there is equivalence between those two things and the fact that there exists a parameter omega on the sphere such that this holds. It's not very difficult to see. First, you write things in the reference frame um, of the center of mass, and then you say that two vectors have the same 
uh, modulus if there is a symmetry which goes from one to the other, and this symmetry is exactly the symmetry related to the, to the vector omega, okay? But actually, I will never use this formula, so this is just to <laughs> make the connection uh, with, the, with the talk of Daniela, because I will really now look at the specific case of the dimension two, which is not the physical case, but which is a case in which it's a little easier to do the computations. So I would like to use a parameterization which holds only in dimension two for the same, for the same kernel. So when n equal two, there is another parameterization which is actually a much better behaved from the point of view of math. And it's the following. So it's a still the same formula, but now since the dimension is two, the integral is taken over R2 for the variable V star, and the second variable will be chosen in S1, so in the, in the circle, and one good way to parameterize the circle is just to write an angle between uh, minus pi and pi. So let's call it theta. Then the rest is identical. And here, usually we take Uh, a parameterization of the cross section, which is such that it is the absolute value of theta which appears in the second variable of, of B, which I call here B2. And the parameterization is given by the following formula, which I think it may be easier to understand if you are familiar with, the, with using uh, the center of mass reference frame. So the center of mass reference frame means that you look at the average of the velocities before collision, so it's V plus V star over two. So once you are in this frame, the two velocities are V minus V star over two and V star minus V over two. So if you look in this frame, the collision uh, happens with just two particles arriving like this and then they will get out like this, and you will use the angle between those two lines to parameterize the collision. So if you do that, it just amounts to say that you use a rotation of angle theta taken on V minus V star over two. And actually this parameterization is, uh, is probably the best, unfortunately, it works only in dimension two, because it's not so easy to parameterize uh, the sphere in dimension uh, uh, three uh, with something which has the properties of a group. When I say it's not so easy, it's a euphemism. <laughs> so the, the point here is that you have all the good properties with this parameterization, because it's something which is linear in terms of V V star gives V prime V prime star, and it is something in which the parameter appears in a very simple way, whereas here, as you can see, the omega uh, appears in a quadratic way, okay? So this is uh, something which makes the computation usually quite easier. And it's the reason why what I will present to you now is presented only in dimension two, because it's a little easier to do the computations, but I promise to you that uh, all what I will now say is a still uh, a true in dimension bigger than two, provided that you accept to do the heavy computations, okay? So, let me do now By the way, for those who wish to see another slide, <laughs> this is already written here. Uh, So let me now give a definition. 
the definition of the so-called grazing collisions. So if we consider that the Boltzmann equation in itself is a definition, it's a, actually the number five. Uh, we say that uh, grazing collisions are collisions such that the velocity after the collision is close to the velocity before the collision, which also is equivalent to the fact that the same holds for the second partner. So a grazing collision is a collision in which the velocities are changed by a very small amount. And as you can see, looking at the formulas that you have here, this is equivalent to saying that V minus V star is almost orthogonal uh, to omega. So all of this is equivalent to V minus V star uh, is almost orthogonal to omega, if you use the omega representation written here. Or if you prefer, it also, uh, it also corresponds to theta, which are close to zero. But if you take theta is equal to zero, you will just get V plus V star over two plus V minus V star over two, which is equal to V, okay? So another way of looking at grazing collisions consists in writing that t theta is close to zero. Is that okay? And uh, the, uh, uh, the remark, remark which is actually due to, uh, I think, uh, both Lando and uh, Chapman and Colling so this is uh, this is something which was understood uh, between the 30s and the 50s is that for plasmas all collisions are in fact grazing collisions so in plasmas the main difference that you have uh, between uh, for the particles with, uh, with, with respect to a neutral gas, is that the particles are charged, so you have like electrons and ions, and when they collide, they collide because of the Coulomb potential, and actually the Coulomb potential has a very long tail, that is you can feel another particle from very far away, and because of this, um, you, can, uh, you can guess that the, in, a, in a typical collision uh, with a Coulomb potential, uh, the uh, amount of velocity which is exchanged during the collision is very small. And so uh, this remark, which was done, let's say, at the, at the, at the physical level, uh, uh, has deep consequences uh, at the level of the operators, so for plasmas, all collisions, when I say all, uh, well, it's not really a, a mathematical statement, let's say. All collisions are grazing. So this means that when you're looking at a plasma, basically you should take the Boltzmann operator, let's say this one in dimension two, and you should perform a limit when theta goes to zero inside the operator, okay? V prime and V prime star depend, depends on theta through both formulas, and you try to let theta go to zero. So let's try to do this. So that is theta go to zero. So let's do the computation. when n is equal to two. So let's forget forever 
the general case, and let's concentrate on the case of dimension two. If you let theta go to zero, you see that you can write V prime as V plus V star over two plus V minus V star over two cos theta uh, plus V minus V star over two orthogonal sin theta, where I use the sign orthogonal for the rotation of angle pi over two of a vector, okay? So by definition, this is just this. Is just this. And now if you uh, expand uh, the cosine and the sine uh, thanks to, uh, let's say, a Taylor expansion, um, you see that you get V plus V star over two plus V minus V star over two uh, minus V minus V star over four uh, theta square plus V minus V star over two orthogonal theta plus something which is of order theta to the three when theta go to zero, goes to zero, okay? And you can simplify the first uh, term here and get exactly V, which is not surprising since we saw that uh, this parametrization is chosen in such a way that when theta is equal to zero, then the collision uh, corresponds to no collision at all, if you wish. Okay, if we do the same for V prime star, the result is given by the following formula, which I will not uh, detail, but it's of course very easy to check. So we end up with a formula which is very close. Okay. And now let's compute at the formal level f of v prime, f of v prime star, sorry, using those formulas. So this amounts to have uh, f of v plus v minus v star over two orthogonal theta minus v minus v prime v star theta square plus this times the quantity which is here And when you perform now the, uh, when you expand F in uh, uh, Taylor series around V here and V star here, uh, you can believe me that uh, what you get is the following. So I will try. Make no mistakes here, so you have terms in theta, you have terms in theta square, sorry, let me, let me write it rather here, so it's f of v plus v minus v star orthogonal gradient f of v theta minus v minus v star over four gradient f of v theta square plus 
This is the sum over components of V minus V star orthogonal A and J. This is divided by two. And here I have the second derivative of F with respect to variables I and J, theta square over two. And you have, uh, let's say, uh, a formula which looks like the same and which starts with F of V star. But the rest has more or less the same shape. So let's have a look to, to what happens uh, in, the, in the kernel. We just computed this times this when theta is close to zero. The first term is f of v times f of v star, which will cancel with the f of v times f of v star, which is here. The second term will be made of things which are proportional to theta. But the point is that here, the cross section depends upon theta in an even way. And because of this, the term with theta will give a contribution which will be zero in the integral, okay? Because of a parity argument. And so, what happens is that only the second order terms uh, are not zero. And you can check that here you will have uh, things which look like the quantities that you see here. So, uh, as you can see, inside you will have things which look like this one, or the same with gradient f of v star. So you can expect to, uh, to have inside the result terms in which you have first order derivatives of f, and they will be multiplied typically by v minus v star. This is a scalar product. And you will also have terms which look like this, okay? Now, if you take the a tensor product of the orthogonal of two vector, it's exactly as taking identity minus the tensor product of the corresponding vectors. So you can also expect to have terms which would look like this, identity, uh, times v minus v star to the square minus the tensor product of v minus v star uh, with itself. And we do the contracted product with the gradient of the gradient of f. Let me say that this is just a shorthand notation for the matrix which have the component V minus V star square delta IJ minus V minus V star I V minus V star J. And the contracted product consists in taking the sum over all possible components of this quantity. So if you don't like, let's say, the abstract algebraic notation, you can use the components and you will find this. Okay, so I will not perform this computation because it would need like half an hour more, <laughs> actually. Uh, but I will write for you the result on the slide. So maybe let's look at this slide. When you do this uh, asymptotics, which is sometimes called the grazing collision asymptotics in the Boltzmann kernel, you end up with the formula which is written here, and which is called the Landau operator for uh, collisions in plasmas. So, the, how does this relate to the computation that we have done here? Just have a look to this A here. This A is made of 
one part which is a number and one matrix. And this matrix is exactly the matrix which is written here, up to the multiplication by uh, z square. Okay? And this is applied to gradient f of v, and then you have a divergence here. So this is a second derivative which uh, corresponds to the second derivative that you have here. As for the first order terms, you can uh, see that they arise from the part of the operator which is here, in which you have just one derivative, because this one can be absorbed by an integration by parts. So you can believe me that when you do seriously this computation, yeah. Yeah, yeah I will, uh, I, I will. Uh, okay. Okay. It's just in the, not in the right order. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I will, promised. So uh, what you get at the end is really this. And what I will do now is just write it on the blackboard because we will need this definition in the SQL. So this is definition six, wish. So the Lando operator defined by Q Lando and of a parameter psi, which is a given function. It is quadratic, so we typically denote uh, the operator with uh, the notation Q of F, F. And uh, this is the divergence of psi of V minus W. Usually we do not use V star for the lambda operator, it's rather the common notation is rather W. We have this pi of V minus W, which is a matrix. And this matrix is applied to the vector which is obtained by taking this kind of symmetric form in which both F and the gradient of F are appearing. So here, pi of V minus W, this is uh, the projector onto the hyperplane which is uh, orthogonal to uh, V minus W, and its components are given by the identity, so delta ij minus v minus w i, v minus w j divided by the modulus of v minus w to the square. So you can, you can just take it as a definition, and in fact, it's the way uh, it's really as a definition that it was proposed by Landau in 36, in his first paper on the Landau equation. That is, Landau made no link between the operator which is defined here and the Boltzmann operator. He just wrote it directly like that. And the link which I sort of, uh, let's say, uh, discussed a little, is something that appeared basically in the book of Chapman and Colling, but actually not the first edition, it's a very old book, and it's in, a, in an edition from the 50s that for the first time this link is established. Unfortunately not uh, in the vocabulary of math, so you really have to, to, to read it carefully in order to understand what they really do, but basically it's the computation that I have uh, presented to you. So one way to make this computation precise 
is uh, to actually uh, define uh, a sort of rescaled version of the cross section in the Boltzmann equation. So you define, uh, so you take the Boltzmann equation in dimension two, and you define a new cross section by concentrating the uh, the collisions on the collisions which have very small uh, uh, angled theta that are the grazing collisions. So you do it in this way. So here you divide theta by epsilon, you extend uh, this quantity by zero for theta different from, uh, which is not between minus pi and pi. And you put here one over epsilon to the three, and the three here has nothing to do with the dimension it is uh, obtained by just putting one over epsilon in order to have something which is of uh, integral one, let's say, or a fixed integral, and then the one over epsilon square which remains correspond to the fact that the two first terms are disappearing in the computation. So if you, since you go to order two, you have to divide by one over epsilon to the square in order to get something which is finite at the end. So this is the right way to do let's say, the, mathematically, the computation which is done here. And um, let's say the proof that you have this property here, that the, you can go from the Boltzmann equation operator to the Boltzmann to the Lando operator for a given f, it's something which was written down, I think, first at the mathematical level in the early 90s. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Brigitte uh, luquin dereux and uh, Pierre Degon, and also a paper by myself on this topic, uh, but the real hard proof is actually uh, can be found in, in a series of papers by Alexandre and Villani, so I think there are actually two papers which were written around 2000 in which they do not only prove that for a given f this is converging uh, uh, to this, but that for the solution of the equations uh, you have a convergence of uh, let's say f epsilon towards f and they do it in the setting of renormalized solutions of uh, Lyons and Dipernat. So I will not say much more about this, but let's say the, the, the hard mathematics is done in this, uh, in this paper here. Okay, so this is more to convince you that you can get uh, Lando out of Boltzmann. My, uh, my lectures are really not on this topic uh, this time, uh, but at least looking at this, uh, at this uh, uh, link between the two equations, you can guess something. It is that since the Maxwellians were steady solutions of the Boltzmann equation, they are still steady solutions of the Landau equation because the Landau equation is obtained as a limit of the Boltzmann equation, of the Boltzmann operator. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't remember what is ex the exact hypothesis in, in their results, but it, it seems to me, yeah, but uh, in some sense, when you do this, you sort of forget about the fact that they are charged particles and you can look for any kind of B and any kind of C. And at the mathematical level, of course, you can decide what are your hypotheses. So the important point is that at the end, it should contain the Coulomb case, which corresponds to C equal to one over Z. And if I remember, it is a case in at least the second paper uh, of Alexandre and Villani. So it contains the, the interesting case. Uh, but of course, for the mathematical point of view, you can try for any kind of cross sections. Well, so uh, it's, not, it's not a surprise that the Maxwellian are still steady solution of the Landau equation, but I think it's important to uh, check this directly on the Landau kernel, so I will do that uh, immediately, because this is really the first, the first step to the entropy structure of the equation. So in order to do this, let's uh, Let's look at the quantity gradient m over m when m is a Maxwellian. This is just the logarithmic uh, gradient of m, 
And since this is an exponential in the logarithmic uh, derivative, of course, it disappears. And then you just have to take the derivative of this, or the gradient, or the, let's say, the derivatives of this. And as you can see, this is a second order polynomial, so the derivative will be actually an affine function. Okay. So gradient m over m, it is something which can be written like, if I'm not mistaken, b minus 2c uh, scalar product with v. This is affine. Okay. And so when you compute now f of w, so here m of w, gradient m of v minus m of v, gradient m of w, you can put m of v, m of w as a factor, and you will get just gradient m of v over m of v minus gradient m of w over m of w. Okay? And so this is m of v, m of w times this quantity at point V minus this quantity at point W. What I get is just minus 2C V minus W. So here, if F is a Maxwellian, this is just uh, something which is a multiple of V minus W. But the operator pi here is a, exactly the projector, the projector onto the orthogonal of V minus W. So when you apply it on this vector here, you get zero, okay? So this is a way of seeing that Maxwellians are steady solutions of the Landau equation without knowing anything on the Boltzmann equation, okay? Let me at this level say one word about the, this strange operator here. So, uh, let me first say that this is not only uh, an object uh, with which mathematicians are playing. It's really what is used in uh, numerical codes when you want to uh, understand the effect of collisions in the plasma. So it's uh, something which is really uh, of uh, interest for the, for the physicists. And, uh, let me add that it has a structure which is uh, uh, quite fascinating because uh, if you are familiar with parabolic equations or let's say with uh, elliptic equations, then you can see that you have a structure which is quite uh, uh, common. That is, uh, you have the divergence of something times the gradient plus something times the function, so it's like you have a diffusion coefficient and a drift coefficient in front of F, so it looks like the usual uh, thing you can find. But the, uh, uh, the point is that those coefficients are obtained through an integral of F in the variable W. So they are themselves depending on F. So it looks more like, uh, let's say, a nonlinear diffusion but usually, in nonlinear diffusion, you look rather to things which are, let's say, local, like Laplacian of f square. And here, it's not Laplacian of f square, it's like Laplacian of f times f convoluted with something. And so, one uh, way of looking at this is just to forget everything about kinetic theory and to try to use parabolic theory to, to get uh, some insight. And there are a lot of works which have been done in this direction. And then there is a second uh, way of looking at things, which is to uh, keep the symmetric form that we have here. As you can see, this is extremely symmetric. And uh, this means that somehow you forget about the parabolic nature uh, of the problem and you really base your analysis on, on, on kinetic theory. So there is some, uh, so, some kind of uh, two ways of looking at the same object which are completely, completely different. Uh, and let me say that what I will present now, which is the 
entropy structure of the equation is rather based on the kinetic way of looking at things. And uh, it's not so obvious to use the entropy structure if you look at it from the parabolic point of view. Uh, anyway, the main difficulty, as we will see, uh, when we are looking precisely at the most important case from the point of view of physics, that is when the, the, the function psi here is z to the minus one, and this corresponds to the case of plasmas, is that somehow those two terms uh, are, uh, I mean, the, the drift term is not really dominated by the, uh, by the diffusion term. So the symmetry, when you take this potential here, the symmetry uh, plays a very uh, important role in the equation, and trying to use a diffusion without looking at the drift, for example, leads nowhere. Uh, okay, so this is just a general, <laughs> a general remark. Uh, you can see this in some sense as some kind of interpolation between the Boltzmann equation and the Fokker-Planck equation that I presented during the first lecture. From the Boltzmann equation, it retains a quadratic nature, it retains a non-locality, and from the Fokker-Planck equation, it retains, of course, the parabolicity nature of the first term and the drift that you have in the, in the second one. Uh, and from both, it retains the fact that you have a set of steady states which has to do with Gaussian functions. Okay. Well, all of this is a little uh, fuzzy, let's say. <laughs> so let's go back to uh, more practical, uh, practical things. Um, the, uh, next step consists in uh, looking at the weak form of the operator. So here I will not write things down, I will just use slides. Um, the, as usual in PDEs, let's say, or in the theory of integral equation, actually it's the same, it's quite important to understand what happens when you multiply the operator by a test function and you integrate. So this is just uh, the definition of weak formulation, if you wish. So here, if you take the Boltzmann kernel and you multiply by a test function phi, typically what you obtain is a formula in which you have the term which is appearing in the Boltzmann equation, this f of v prime, f of v prime star minus f of v times f of v star, and this is multiplied by phi of v and integrated, okay? Then what you do first is to make a change of variables which transform v in v star and v star in v. When you do that, the phi of v becomes the phi of v star, okay? And if you take the first formulation and the second one and you divide by two, you will get just one half of phi of v plus phi of v star at this level, okay? Once you have done that, you use another symmetry of the equation which consists in changing v and v star in v prime and v prime star. So this is a change of variables which is quite easy to perform. Uh, for example, when you use the parametrization uh, that was uh, uh, presented by Daniela or the parametrization with theta in dimension two. So when you do that, it's easy to say that you have a Jacobian which is one, so it does not appear in the, in the integrals, and the phi of v plus phi of v star becomes phi of v prime plus phi of v prime star, and of course here things are reversed. That is v v star becomes v prime v prime star, v prime prime v prime star becomes v and v star, and so the minus here, uh, 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 makes it that you have to change the signs uh, at this level. Okay, so by doing two changes of variables in the, in the, uh, uh, in the big integral here, you end up with this uh, uh, formula here. By the way, sorry about the, this, this, is, uh, this is not true, it's a, different, uh, it's a different integral here. It's integrated over over the totality of the variables. It was lost in the... Um, so let's, let's look at a direct consequence of, uh, of uh, this formulation, of, the, of this weak formulation. 
Let's now take phi equal to one vi or v square over two. So this corresponds to looking at mass, momentum, and energy on the wall, if you wish. That is, instead of looking at it for just one particle, you just integrate over all the particles entering inside the kernel. So when you do that, if you take phi equal to one, it's clear that you get one plus one minus one minus one and you get zero. If you take any component of V, you will get here, uh, let's say V i plus V star i minus V prime i minus v, v star prime i. And this will be equal to zero since you integrate on a set in which you have this direct mass here. And of course the same will hold for the V square over two here because of the direct mass that you have here. So the first consequence of the weak formulation is that you have this global conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, which is no surprise because this is something that you imposed at the microscopic level, at the level of each collision in the kernel. So you will recover it when you integrate over all possible velocities. And now let's try to do the same for the Lando operator. So the Lando operator is uh, written here, okay? Now you multiply by a test function phi of v and you integrate. So as you can see here, the first thing you have to do is an integration by part which transforms the divergence here in a gradient on the test function. So it's exactly what will happen at this level. You will have this gradient phi of v which will appear and then you do, uh, as in the Boltzmann equation, you do a change of variables which transform V in W and W in V. So when you do that, uh, you, you get gradient phi of W. And if you look at this formula here, you see that this is anti-symmetric with respect to V and W. But if you, if you change V in W, you get exactly the same, except it's a different sign. So because of this, you will get a minus here. Okay. And finally, to get the formula which is here, what you do is just, you just put into factor the f of v and f of w. So you take them out of the formula here, you put them here, and you get gradient f over f minus gradient f over f at points v and w. The way to understand this formula is that you have a matrix here, which is a projection operator, which acts on two vectors as a quadratic form. The first one is this one, and the second one is this one, okay? Now let's try to see what happens if I take again phi equal to one vi or v square over two. If you take phi equal to one, it's clear that you get zero because gradient phi is zero. If you take uh, let's say any of the components of the momentum V, then the gradient will just give you uh, quantities which will be constants. So you will get a constant minus itself, so you will get zero. And finally, if you take the energy here, you will get gradient phi of V equal to V, and you get V minus W at this level. And you remember that this is a projector onto the orthogonal of V minus W. So this gives you also zero. Actually, you could get this uh, formula directly from the uh, uh, limit that you have, uh, from this link that you have between the Boltzmann equation and the Landau equation, okay? But it's better to, to get it directly from the formula of the Landau equation. And now, it, uh, I still have five minutes to present to you the entropy structure itself that will be the main uh, object for uh, the two last uh, lectures. So, uh, this is the so-called H theorem of Boltzmann. So in the case of the Boltzmann equation, it was proven by Boltzmann himself around 1860. And it consists uh, of noticing that if the, in the weak formulation of the Boltzmann equation, there is something which happens if you take phi of v equal to log f of v. So take, just take phi of v equal to log f of v. So you replace here phi by log f. 
What happens with the log is that you can transform log f of v plus log f of v star in log of f of v times f of v star. So it's exactly what you will find in this slide. Uh, here I used log f of v as uh, the test function. And here you will get log f, log of f of v prime, f of v prime star minus log of f of v, f of v star. And you see that using the log is the only way to get here something which depends on these products. Any other function would not give you that. It will still give you uh, something which you cannot relate to the quantities which are here. OK? And now the, 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 the observation of Boltzmann is that it's as if you had something like x minus y times log x minus log y. And since the logarithm is an increasing function, this is non-negative. Okay. And so, uh, if now you define the Boltzmann equation as df over dt is equal to Q of F, or Q of FF. And you call H of F the integral of F log F E. You see that D over DT of H of F is the integral of log f plus 1 df over dt uh, of tv dv. So this is always true. And now, if uh, df over dt is equal to the Boltzmann operator. So if f is satisfying the Boltzmann equation, then the quantity here is equal to Q Boltzmann B of f f of T V log f of T V. Because remember that 1 uh, multiplied by the Boltzmann kernel and integrated gives 0. This is the conservation of mass. And you get exactly the quantity which is here. And so you see that this is uh, negative. And what you have obtained is the entropy structure for the Boltzmann equation. That is, uh, this entropy, this is an entropy. So the proposition is that H is an entropy for the Boltzmann equation. And the entropy dissipation, which I will call D, as I did in the first uh, lecture, is given by this formula here. OK? So this is the entropy structure for the Boltzmann equation. Uh, I don't know if I still have one minute, maybe, at least to announce what I will do <laughs> uh, tomorrow. So the point is that. Since the Landau equation, the Landau kernel is a limit of the Boltzmann kernel, you can only expect that by doing the same transformation, that is, you multiply by log f, you integrate, you will get something positive. Okay. This is a direct consequence of the link between the two. But actually, it's better to see directly on the, on the kernel. So if you remember the weak formulation of the Landau equation, which is here, what happens if now you put log f instead of phi? As you can see, you will get gradient of log f of v, which is gradient f over f. 
And so you end up here with gradient f over f of v minus gradient f over f of w. And you have here a symmetric matrix which is taken on the same vector as a quadratic form. And so in order to see that this is positive, it is enough to know that this matrix is definite positive or at least semi-definite positive. And since it is a projection, it is in fact semi-definite positive, okay? So you get that this is also bigger than zero. And the proposition which is here is also true as a consequence for the Landau equation. So let me finish by saying that since now we have the entropy structure for both the Boltzmann and the Landau equation, the point is to check that this entropy structure is strict and then to try to produce an entropy-entropy dissipation estimate which if uh, it exists uh, will lead to uh, convergence theorem for the uh, Boltzmann or Landau equations when the time t goes to infinity. And this will be the point of the two last lectures uh, that I will present tomorrow. Okay, I think I stop here.